11.30, how are we doing today? Doing good? Good, all right, I want everyone to stand up real quick. I know you're, I know, I know you're sitting down, but we got lunch coming up. I want everyone to stand up with us real quick. And I want everyone to do three things with me today. The first thing I want you to say is just engage. Say engage. I want you to say the second one, I want you to say, I am powerful. And lastly, I am impactful. Wonderful. Well, thank you, 1130. We're going to get you guys going. Go ahead and take a seat unless, we also want to see in the crowd here, unless you're an entrepreneur or investor. Entrepreneurs and investors stay standing for us today. We want to make sure we can tailor the presentation for you all today. Wow, we've got a lot in the audience. Okay, amazing. And all the investors, take a seat. If you're an entrepreneur, stay standing. Okay. Amazing. <laughs> if you're both, stay standing and raise your hand. Amazing. Okay, well, wonderful. Go ahead and take a seat. Thank you so much for engaging with us today. My name is Kevin Edwards. I'm the host of the Real Leaders Podcast. And just looking at the crowd today, is Lindsay Smalling in the crowd today, by chance? If she's... I think she texted me. She's not going to make it. She's not going to... Like, it's like when you make a jump shot, you look at your parents in the crowd, and they're not there. <laughs> that's, that's how it is. Well, well, backstory with Lindsay, she was actually my first interview of the Real Leaders Podcast seven years ago. And we had a camera... We had a microphone, and we had an idea. And that idea was, could we make money if we went out and interviewed social entrepreneurs and brought their success stories to life to inspire purposeful careers? We sent emails out to about 100 CEOs, and we finally got a yes. And that was Lindsay Smalling seven years ago. A great segue into this podcast. We just want to welcome you all to the 806th episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Edwards. And alongside me today, folks, we have Sandy Moore, the Chief Impact Officer and Managing Director at Advantage Capital. We have Elaine Rasmussen. Yeah, go ahead and round of applause for Sandy. These are all of our Real Leaders Impact Collaborative founding members. We have Elaine Rasmussen, the founder and CEO of Social Impact Now. And last but not least, we have John Denniston, the co-founder of in, and chair of Shared Acts. Please give John a warm round of applause. And today, folks, we're going to help you do one of the hardest things in the human species. You know what that is? We're going to help you turn a no, that's right, into a yes. So let's start off with <clears throat> Miss Sandy Moore here in Sandy. You've been on the podcast a few times. Yes. And you know that the last question we ask everyone in the Real Leaders podcast is, what is your definition of a real leader? I've got to tell you, Sandy, there's never been one answer that's been the same, which says a lot about yeah. leadership. That's right. Now, for you, for someone who's raised a fund, someone who has been on the receiving end of that investment side, what are some of the key leadership qualities someone needs to know in order to get a no into a yes? Kevin... You know, the list could contain 760 variations of things. Um, but from experience, I got a little bit of that uh, on both sides of the table. I chose to talk about four today with, with our audience. And, and, and these, these are, uh, from my experience, being both an investor at Advantage Capital. That's what we do. We invest in small businesses. And as the leader of Empower the Change, um, several, we have a team of leaders, which is a fun. I've been on both sides of the table, and I've found these things to be universal. So the first thing I want to I wanna share as a leadership uh, characteristic is you got to be somebody that folks want to do business with. That's the very first thing. And that requires a certain degree of leadership ability. Specifically, you've got to be able to communicate You've got to be able to articulate. You have got to be able to persuade. And those are leadership characteristics that you don't have to wake up and be born with, but that you can learn. Um, next, you really, on both sides of the table, I've seen this, you've got to be a person um, that demonstrates strong leadership, demonstrates strong leadership. And you do that in a cocktail of ways, um, a cocktail of things demonstrated, past performance, current presence, and future opportunity. I mean, people need to be able to figure out what have you done that suggests you will successfully do this. Without that, 
you can't get to a really important investment requirement, and that is that the investor has confidence mm -hmm. and trusts you. Getting to that, uh, demonstrating strong leadership also requires you to have some transparency. If I can't figure you out with regard to the business proposition we're talking about, I'm not going to give you my money. And I have found that to be true when I am asking for money. What's your leadership methodology? I know, sounds like some kind of formulaic thing. It isn't. It's really this. How do you build, manage, and then empower a team? You're not a one-woman show, generally, if you want my money. And I haven't been able to get anybody else's as a one-woman show. So can you weigh? Can you analyze? Can you decide? Somebody's got to make decisions. That's, that's just required. That's a leadership characteristic. And then last, um, show confidence. You know, you got to bet on you. People have to believe that you believe in you. But that confidence I've experienced needs to be demonstrated by competence, not cockiness. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it, and I've tried not to e exhibit it, although I probably have somewhere along the way. I've seen confidence that came across as cockiness, and I didn't want to invest in that. And I've seen and tried to demonstrate confidence based on competence, and I've been able to raise money around it. So um, those are the four, four kinds of characteristics essential to getting the yes, because money follows good ideas that people with the money believe that the person they're going to give it to can achieve that good idea. And that requires that I've got confidence, you've articulated, you've persuaded, you've demonstrated that you can build the team, that an important piece at the end of the line of all of that is I can then believe that you're going to get me my money back. Mm -hmm. That's the game, right? I want my money back, and I want the other outcomes that I am seeking as an investor. And I want to be able to demonstrate to you that I'll get those outcomes if you invest in me. It's simple. Very simple, of course, and thank you, Sandy. And for the entrepreneurs listening out there, when we asked them to stand up, there were plenty remaining. In your experience, what are some of the red flags that are out there when someone's pitching you on something you talked about, cockiness, mm -hmm. things that can get in the way of a deal? So what are some of those things? Cockiness can get in the way of a deal, but I think one that gets in the way of a deal even quicker mm -hmm. is the, the failure to understand your competition. Mm -hmm. I love, oh, we don't have any competitors. Not a good answer as a general rule. Uh, we're slaying the competitors, and here they are, and this is why I can get all of that. The other thing that gets in the way a lot is not being able to understand how I'm going to get my money back or the outcome that I'm seeking. You're not being able to follow through and understand your business proposition well enough to figure out how it what the opportunities for exit might be or what the opportunity is for us to make the money that we think we need to make on this particular investment. Those things get in the way, and they're related to leadership because they are really about taking the time to get outside of this wonderful idea you have as an entrepreneur and figure out how you will manage to sell it. Mm -hmm. That's the leadership foundation that is missing in those things. And for those of you who don't know what Real Leaders does, we have these CEO forums that we do once a month, and we have a no advice rule. So we always like to share from, from experience. And so, Sandy, in your experience now raising capital, yeah. raising a fund, yeah. what was your approach? Well, let me say to you, first of all, that we got lots of no's before we got to a yes. Plenty of no's. Uh, I'd say at a ratio of five no's, maybe 10 to every yes. So that's the first thing is I had to come to a realization that no matter how excited we were about our product and the fund and the outcomes we could reach with the fund, everybody just was not going to get there with us. So I also learned a very important thing, that the pitch has got to be right. And by that I mean the pitch has got to be right um, defined, right in its presentation, and right in its mesh with the outcomes that the investor is interested in. So a lot of our early no's were related to mismatch between the pitch 
and the investor. Hmm. And we, the Empower the Change Fund is the name of the fund, dynamic idea and concept to invest exclusively in minority business enterprises, but it is a different kind of fund and we really missed early on on the match. Elaine, were you gonna say? I was, I was gonna say that's really, a really interesting segue into what Elaine was yeah. talking about, this misalignment between entrepreneur and investor. Elaine, what's something an entrepreneur needs to know, K-N-O-W, in order to get a yes? Yeah, so I think there's a few things. And so just a little bit about my background. I was a salesperson. I've done inside sales. I've done retail sales. I was a marketing person, which is basically a different kind of sales. <laughs> You're selling people on an idea. You're trying to convince and persuade people to buy something that they sometimes don't need or want. <laughs> um, I, I've had to, I've launched a fund. I've been a fundraiser um, with a nonprofit. So I've done almost everything you can do in the sales perspective and one of the things that I think is really 100% consistently true is that whole thing about knowing who you're talking to getting strategic and I think what happens with entrepreneurs one of the things that I like to say is hustle mode has a shelf life <laughs> I'm gonna say it again hustle mode has a shelf life hustle is what got you to start your business Hustle was the thing that convinced you when everyone told you that you were crazy to leave your job, that you were crazy <laughs> to, to go up and do this thing. That was hustle. But hustle is playing checkers. And eventually you need to get to playing chess. You've got to play the long game. And for me, that's about getting strategic. And getting strategic means getting prepared, understanding who you're talking to, knowing... Do a Google search. I cannot tell you how many times that there's been a pitch and the person didn't go through the homework of just Googling the person that they were going to meet. Check out their LinkedIn. Check out what they've done. What have they invested in in the past so that you understand how to position your pitch, right? If they are not investing in consumer packaged goods, maybe it's not a good use of your time to pitch them. But the other side of that is for the investor, right? And I don't know if, Kevin, you were going to talk to me about that, but I want to talk a little bit about it's, it, it's not just the responsibility of the entrepreneur. Um, investors need to be just as clear about what their investing is. And I think if you get a certain level, VCs are really good about this. But I think our angel and seed investors need to be more unapologetic about where, where do they want to invest their money and not just take meetings because they want to hear like something really cool. Because you're taking time away from the entrepreneur from actually running the business. Right. So I, I really want our investors to get unapologetic about what their investment thesis is and get to a quick no. An entrepreneur will so appreciate it if you just tell them no right away. You can always come back later, right? Um, there might be a price to pay, but you can always come back later. But the, really the goal is be unapologetic about your investment thesis and get to a quick no. If you don't want to invest in retail, be clear about that. Don't waste an entrepreneur's time with having three and four and five dinners or coffees when you're not when you're on the fence about thinking about wh what it is that you want to do. Um, so really, it's about entrepreneurs knowing who they're talking to and understanding who they're talking to, what their motivations are. So much is public now. You can find out what other things they've invested in. You can call those people that they've invested in and ask them about what their experience. It's about, what is the, what's the saying? Luck is preparation meeting opportunity. Okay. So be prepared. And I know you're busy doing your, your, you're building your business, but I think it's worthwhile if you're actually gonna go into looking for investors, Put it on your calendar an hour a week, 30 minutes a week to do something, whether it's Google somebody, LinkedIn somebody, call and make an appointment with somebody that they've invested in. Do something so that you're constantly moving the needle forward. Elaine, um, you and I work on our affinity group together, so I know you've got some real insight on BIPOC um, um, entrepreneurs and um, what investors and those entrepreneurs need to be thinking about. Say something about that. Ooh, that's a whole panel. <laughs> here's, here's what I would say on both sides. One, for the investors and the venture, particularly venture capital, we know that only 2% of venture capital is going to women and even less is going to BIPOC people, right? So let's turn that around. What does that say? That means that 99% of the pitches that went in front of VCs were bad. And I refuse to believe that. 
I refuse to believe that 99% of women, or 98% of women, 98% of BIPOC people who went in front of investors had a bad pitch, right? So what we know is that there is still an embedded racism and sexism that happens in investing, point blank period. So for investors, once again, this is part of your preparation. What are the biases that you're bringing to the conversation that you may not even know that you're doing? Right? And we get it, right? It's called implicit bias for a reason. Um, but also for our entrepreneurs, our BIPOC entrepreneurs, while it's not fair, you must be better prepared. And you must know your numbers. That's where I find the biggest trip. Know your numbers. I, I sing this song. I'm turning it into a record. because <laughs> I find that that is really what I see as the biggest downfall, is that founders do not know. How much does it cost to, to make the thing? What is, where are they gonna get their contributed margin? At what point will they increase their, their volume pricing, right, so that they can see where their profitability is gonna actually uptick? Um, you know, really thinking about, and I would, I would really encourage you to think about this from the lens of, yes, you might need money, but what you really need is what money can buy you, and sometimes, knowing that is far more important because sometimes you can get that without the money. Um, I've got a great story about how I hired my first employee and I'll tell this really quick. So when I first started my business seven years ago, I needed an employee, I needed help, I was drowning. And um, I knew I had a very small amount of money. So I went through the process of writing a job description. I actually wrote three job descriptions of somebody who could give me exponential time back. I met this woman at an event, really, uh, I, met th I met this woman at an event, and I said, well, what do you do for a living? And she's like, I'm a project manager. That was one of the job descriptions I wrote. I took her to lunch, I said, listen, I can pay you half, half of your rate for four, eight weeks, or I can pay you your rate for four weeks. I said, but if you stay with me for eight weeks, I think I can hook some clients that will allow me to keep you on longer. She said, I'll talk to you, I'll call you back in a couple days. She called me back, she said, I will take half my pay for eight weeks. She stayed with me for three years. And to me, just listening, this is really interesting to me because in a simple sense, it's like an alignment of strategies, investor and entrepreneur. It's like your first home search, like your first home buyer, right? The realtor is gonna ask you, okay, Kevin, what location do you wanna search in? Are you doing single family, multifamily, duplex, triplex? So where, where in this search um, should investors be thinking about um, I guess, how should they change their search projects to include more of BIPOC and black and brown female entrepreneurs? So I think it's getting connected to your ecosystem. I think, you know, our networks are look like us. So if you're a white woman who lives in, in an affluent neighborhood, ours is Minnetonka or Edina, you're not gonna know any BIPOC founders, <laughs> right? You're just not, they're not, in your, you're, they're not in your purview. So the homework becomes for you to learn and understand and seek out, it's homework for you, right? Just like we just told the entrepreneurs, they have homework, you have homework. You have homework to go and find those places and spaces. So we have a, a nonprofit in the Twin Cities called Connective Institute, where that's all we do is we're an enterprise development and social finance studio. So we know where those people are. There's lots of other organizations very similar to us. Some of them are here. But getting connected to those communities, because also sometimes you are unaware of how you come into the conversation. And so those organizations will help you come into the conversation, because investing in these businesses is different. It is different. And there are, you can see me afterwards and I'll happy to tell you what those differences are, but it is different. So we want you to be successful, but we also want them to be successful. And that requires you to do a little bit of your own due diligence to understand how can you show up as the best investor and the best supporter of these businesses and not bring some of your bias um, into what could be a wonderful relationship and conversation that makes money for both of you. So thanks, Elaine, and, and uh, you know, where I want to take this is, you know, in order to find that home, that search, that entrepreneur, there needs to be a, the marketplace. I mean, the marketplace needs to be created. So I just want to see a show of hands here in the crowd. Let's get elbow over ears. If you have worked on Wall Street before, okay, I got a couple up there. Anyone that's worked on, in Sand Hill before? Anyone in Sand Hill VC, the VC of Wall Street? Has anyone heard of the impact Wall Street? John, I know you have a few comments on this. The impact Wall Street. Has it been made yet? Yeah, so uh, it's an honor to be here. And Sandra and Lane, just fantastic insights. 
Thank you, and Kevin, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so Kevin's question to me is, where is the impact Wall Street? And to me, it's a paradox, because at the same time, it's everywhere and nowhere. It's everywhere because I'm not aware of a capital market segment that's not, to some degree, moving in the impact direction. I don't know it. So impact funds, agriculture, education, social funds, family offices, university endowments, strategic investors, faith-based investors, everywhere. But it's also nowhere in the sense that there isn't either figuratively or virtually a headquarters. So public equity investing is so efficient they named a street after it, Wall Street, and venture capital has become kind of so efficient that they've named a road after it, Sand Hill Road. But in the impact economy, the streets have no names. So let me begin on the, the negative part, finish on a strong part, the opportunity set that comes from everywhere, but the, the negative of the nowhere is it's really inefficient. From an impact company's perspective, and in particular the CEO, there is no Wall Street. You can't walk up and down a street. It's not centralized. It's diffuse. It's like a, a blockchain. The impact economy is a blockchain, and nobody has the key. So uh, from a, an impact company's perspective, CEO's perspective, what do you do about that? And I think one strategy that I've seen used to, with some success is a force multiplication strategy, similar to, Elaine, what you were saying, which is build and exercise your network. And the funniest thing happens when you call somebody who's a friend or a colleague or a board member or an advisory board member, we're raising a round, what do you know? And uh, I think doing that intentionally is, it'll just cast the net more widely in this blockchain where nobody has the key. Uh, the, from those who are in the capital formation business, I, I mean, this is probably the most inefficient market in the capital markets, and it's a screaming opportunity to build a stronger conduit between the impact funds looking for breakthrough impact innovation and great impact entrepreneurs. And, it's, um, and some efforts have been made but it's, it's a tall task because nobody has the key to the system. I think a couple other ideas for, uh, for impact companies. The, the first is just the whole idea of impact innovation. And so uh, the analogy I'd give you is business schools teach business model innovation to increase profits, and engineering schools teach technical innovation to build a better product. But there's this idea also of the continuous improvement of the impact delivered by an impact company, which casts a different light on the purpose of impact metrics. So the conversation overwhelming is, well, we, we have to know what impact have you had in the past, which is really important, so I'm not diminishing that. But there's another purpose, too, which is that same impact data provides the data set for how your impact has performed for its impact purpose. And so in, it's also possible for a management team to design little experiments, A-B experiments, in a given year. What if we compared this to that, that to that, and the continuous improvement? So, And I think that that approach, a strong impact innovation approach, would differentiate impact companies when going to meet with investors because many of the investors want to have powerful impact, optimize for their dollar invested, and uh, a plan of continuous uh, improvement would do that. The other, the other thing that's really amazing about the everywhere part, the positive part of the impact economy is no longer is the capital limited to equity and debt. Now there's blended capital. 
And so there's all this manner of innovation taking place in the capital markets for carbon, by example, not limited to this, carbon credits, social bonds, green bonds, and other. There's this great blending taking place between for profit and impact, and that the innovation is not limited to the impact companies' entrepreneurs. It's happening. It has happened. It's continuing. It's early, but it's happening in the capital markets. The other thing to be aware of for uh, an impact company and the CEO is two meteors <laughs> hit the United States uh, in August, largely hidden in plain sight. So there, there's the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act of 2022. Really, the Inflation Reduction Act is mostly about funding climate solutions. Deployment, not invention. $370 billion, with a B. Some of that for marginalized communities in the United States. $370 billion arriving just as the capital markets are going from capital abundance in the direction of capital scarcity. Remarkable. The other, the, other, the Chips and Science Act is for the science-based impact companies. 200, it's, the headlines are about semiconductors, reshore chips, Chips and Science Act. But the Science Act is the dominant part, $200 billion for scientific research in uh, some design, well, a whole bunch of designated areas. And so for those with technical innovation opportunities, it's, that just landed. And they were signed by President Biden within seven days of each other. It's remarkable. Largely hidden in plain sight what that means for the impact economy. So those are a couple ideas. The last thing I would say for uh, family offices, the family offices have been the heroes and heroines in the impact economy from a capital perspective. People have written about this, but I just want to say that out loud. Extraordinary uh, how the leadership that family offices have provided. Many of them are building their strength by creating collaborations, coalitions, so there's more power that they're bringing. And I would encourage family offices to do that more often and put a flag up so the entrepreneurs can see, like Elaine said, who you are, what you're doing, while you're doing it. Uh, but, you know, mostly hats off to the family offices. Hi, John, we just spoke a lot about today. We're here, obviously, to learn how to get no into a yes. We talked about strategy alignment. We talked about leadership qualities. You raised the question of social innovation in a business. From your experience, what were some of the helpful questions that investors asked you during your race? Trying to uh, sort for the non-standard questions because we got every single standard question, <laughs> including who are your competitors and everything you talked about, Sandra. Uh, I would say, uh, because our company, SharedX, has both an environmental and a social objective, lifting smallholder farmer incomes through regenerative agriculture. The, the, one of the best questions that we got, what's, is there a multiplication potential between the two? That, that is, by doing regenerative, can you further increase small farmer incomes? Uh, and so we actually, I think that, that was a very insightful question. I think that this, uh, let me just stand that for a moment if I can. Jane Goodall wrote a book last year called The Book of Hope. Everybody should read The Book of Hope. It's really, it's really good. And uh, she, she also wrote the foreword in a book called Regeneration by Paul Hawken. And so in it, she tells the story about when she first went to Tanzania in 1960 to save, help save the chimpanzee communities. She quickly came to the realization she couldn't do that. She couldn't accomplish the mission unless the poverty of the nearby human communities was alleviated because there was economic value in the skulls of the chimpanzees and the trees in which they lived. And so this inextricable link between poverty and the environment is, I think, powerful and largely hidden in plain sight. Amazing. 
for those of you who don't know about John's business, Shared X, uh, regenerative farming helps to question more carbon, increase more yields, and also while doing that, bring people out of poverty by increasing their wages. Um, here's another question for you all while we have some time remaining. And just for folks listening out there, if you have the app, go to the event agenda. You can actually ask questions. I'm sure you guys have already done that. But I've got a big iPad up here, and I want to answer your questions. And we'll do that with about uh, probably eight minutes remaining. So another six minutes still left. Kevin, before you move, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd like to yeah, build absolutely. a bit on the last thing that John talked about in terms of um, impact innovation and entrepreneurs who think that way as a road to getting to yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm offering this mm -hmm. from my investor hat um, at, at, at Advantage. And I would say that's so astute. It's such an astute observation because I see our investment team constantly captivated by that entrepreneur who is really thinking about what is the course correction or what is the next opportunity that my current um, operation with your investment might be able to achieve. It is a leadership quality because leaders absolutely must be looking forward, must be looking toward the future, and must have a methodology for bringing their team along there. But I see us in investment committee discussions really getting um, interested at a different kind of level, the level that gets you to yes, in those uh, entrepreneurs who are thinking about course correction, course opportunity, invest in us as we are doing this now because here is the next thing that that will bring that we can do that you know and it's not always the perspective that this is a serial entrepreneur it is simply that this is an entrepreneur that is looking forward on the growth opportunities um, and and that really is important I'm not sure that we see it enough we see great entrepreneurs they've got a great Product, they understand what the impact is today, and that's what they're selling. But I also want to say, particularly to investors, that I think two things can happen. One, because you don't understand the innovation, the innovation gets devalued. So once again, being aware of what your lack of understanding, how it can inhibit you missing a wonderful opportunity, right? Because we just talked about 99% of the 99% of, 99 of the, the presentations were bad, the assumption, right? That that's that was something that was a missed opportunity. So as an investor, I love this space in investing in rural entrepreneurs, investing in and in BIPOC entrepreneurs, because I have no competition. <laughs> I get the pick of my choice, right? Because there is nobody very few people who are investing in this. But I think the other part of innovation is that not innovation for innovation's sake. I will just tell you in the, in, in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, we're all on this tech, 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 tech thing. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the long and the short of it is there aren't a lot of black and brown people creating tech businesses. So if we're dedicating 85% of our resources and our revenue to supporting that, but black and brown people aren't doing that, there's now a mismatch of like what the ecosystem is supporting. So I think it's all, like Sandy was saying, I think it's really important for you as entrepreneurs, whether you're in consumer packaged goods, whether you're in healthcare services, that you are looking forward, right, of thinking about what is the future of my field, my sector, but that may or may not necessarily include tech. I think tech will be a part of it, of how you operationalize it, but don't always think that you have to be building a tech business. But really, I think it's as simple as a Google alert. Put a Google alert on your, on, your, on your browser that says future of whatever it is you do, future of hair care, future of beauty, future. And so you can start to see and be able to answer that question when you're sitting in front of an investor to be like, where do you think this sector is going? How, what do you think is the sunset for your particular business? Or when do you think you might have to start re-engineering or changing your production based on your particular sector? Amazing. Sandy, I, I want to talk about your recent fund that mm -hmm. you raised a little bit, yes. a bit ago. Um, when you got those yeses, mm -hmm. what do you think it was exactly? Was it the alignment? Was it the presentation? Was it just the able, being able to expand upon uh, what you were trying to do? What was it that turned that no into a yes? It was all of that, but I would say alignment, 
presentation and timing. Alignment, first of all, because <clears throat> our LPs are all coming from, uh, not all, but are largely coming from a particular sector, which indicates alignment. What Empower the Change sets out to do aligns with um, banking LPs. But then it is also presentation, because at the end of the day, I still have got, we have still got to be able to, to convince you that if, even though we're aligned, if you come into this fund with us as an LP, we are going to get you across your finish line. And, and, and that's presentation. And that presentation, not, not just simply the, 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 the pitch deck, by that it is the presentation of the ability to achieve those outcomes that goes back to my leadership skills, that, that is my ability to um, give you that cocktail of what past performance, what present uh, uh, situation is, and what future opportunities are that persuade you that we will be able to get across the finish line. So um, that's what I mean by, by presentation. Um, and you asked me that question in our fundraise, and that's, that is my answer. It is alignment, it's presentation, it's timing. We also raised this fund at, at, out of our belief that the timing required us to create, to do what we do best as impact investor, and that is to drive capital to places where it does not ordinarily go. That's our business model. And to make money at it, and to grow businesses, good jobs, good wages. And it was out of that thesis and the timing in America when we said, this is a product that needs to happen following the death of George Floyd and the civil unrest. We said as a firm, there's an economic foundation to what is happening here. And it has to do with what, why such deep economic inequality in these regions? Why no business sector in these regions? Why, why, why? Around things that we knew how to answer. So that alignment, presentation, and timing. Timing, huge. Yeah, I like how you position that too, made it very simple. And, and because your fund and most businesses are so complex. And the, the parallel I wanna draw here and then pass this to John, is that we're on this stage, right? But what you don't see is the incredible staff behind us and all of the moving parts. There's 10, 15 people back there. There's a whole projector. There's so many different things that are going on. But when it comes to your pitch, it's just the center stage that you have to get across to that investor. What are some of the key things you want to make sure that you have to make it simple for that investor, that audience, to understand what you do? You know, I've always found it a positive uh, if the person giving a pitch in the first slide just reduces to it the essence, That's what right. makes the company different. And it's there's no standard approach to that because every company is different and should be different. So what what do you stand for, and uh, and what sets you apart? And then, in my experience, the investor is there and it doesn't have to wait to slide 15 or 18 or 20 to where there's a buildup to what the company is. I think you just lose people's attention in many cases. So just from a, a, a presentation and delivery approach, just starting with the conclusion to some degree. Any comments? Go ahead. No, I, I was like, I was spot on. That's exactly right. You know, I think it's really important for entrepreneurs uh, to understand that, building on this point, I can't, I don't want to guess about what it is that, that differentiate that you're going to do and that differentiates you from the 24 others who are going to talk to us mm -hmm. about being able to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so that really is a skill that the entrepreneur has to hone in on. And when I think about... Um, in the fundraise for Empower, where I'm, in essence, that entrepreneur, very early on, I firmly believed that people were just going to get it because it's a right thing to do to drive capital into minority businesses and grow them. 
what's hard about that? Well, what's hard about that is, well, why hasn't it happened before? It would have been happening a long time ago. You know, and what about all these other programs that have attempted to do the same? And how many of those businesses are there that have the opportunity to take this? There, there's lots that you can't leave your investor prospect guessing about, more importantly, that you can't assume that your investor prospect knows and understands. That's your job. That was our job. And so I described it earlier as mismatch or pitch. There's a subtext to that. It was not just mismatch and pitch. It was also mismatch in the formulation of the pitch, um, assuming that people knew things that they did not know. You know, uh, so so it, uh, it really requires what Elaine talked about. It is the deep work of understanding your product, your audience, your outcomes, mm -hmm. and anticipating all the ways that that can go in a direction that you may not want to go in, but you have to be prepared to answer. Mm -hmm. I love that in closing remark. Sandy Moore, Elaine Rasmussen, and John Ness, and I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there, know your audience, and always, folks, keep it real. Thank you all. And that's typically how we close a podcast here. Just want to thank you all for being here today. We've got about three and a half minutes to answer your questions, so keep on sending them in right now. Uh, and I'm going to ask the first one, just go in, in order here with Sandy. Sandy, how do you deal with finding out who are your co competitors in an informal market? How do you deal with finding out who are your competitors in an informal market? Informal market. All right, the key is the informal market, right? then you've got you to start asking questions. Mm -hmm. You've got to go where you think that thing is happening, and you've got to ask some questions. You have to broaden your funnel. It really is a, a variation of what Elaine said about uh, increasing your ability to know investors where those opportunities are. It's the same here. You've got to, I can't possibly talk about minority business investing and understand who my competitors are if I'm not out talking to MBEs and talking to BIPOC businesses and saying, where'd you get your money and how did you get it and who turned you down and who brought you along? So that's it. Thank you very much for saying I keep rapid fire here. Uh, this one's for John. John. John mentioned the heroes, heroines of impact investing family offices. What public-facing coalitions can investees or funds connect with to find potential family office investors? That's, I mean, of all the inefficient segments of the impact economy, that's the most inefficient. And I wish there were one, actually, therefore the capital market opportunity to do that. Um, I don't know of a single one, and it may be out there, so I don't want to offend anybody. It may be out there. And some groups are pulling family office conferences, but there are so many, and they're so dispersed across the country. I mean, there's concentration too, of course, uh, and so many different areas of interest. And so, uh, honestly, I apologize to the person who asked the question, but Kevin, I don't know. I think there's Solidaire Network. I don't think they're family offices necessarily, but there's Tonic, there's Solidaire Network that are coalescing individuals and individual family offices. So there's some, there's some groups out there, but um, we need more. <laughs> Interesting, here's another question that came in. It says, from the investor perspective, do you consider the potential negative impacts of an investment when deciding whether something is a no or a yes? Yes, absolutely. As an impact investor, we do. We, can, we, we have a phrase for it, we call it reputational risk. Mm -hmm. And we look at reputational risk that's a big part of my job as the chief impact officer, is one, to figure out what's the highest and best uh, impact results we can get in a particular investment, and data drives that decision making, data and experience. And then the other is what is the reputational risk of this particular investment, group of investments, investment in this space, and so forth and so on. And we've made, in my opinion, missed some opportunities that because the reputational risk outweighed uh, at least in my partner's mind, the opportunity. <laughs> Same here, D ditto. Um, we are driven by our values, and so that sometimes requires us to pass even on some of the greatest opportunity, but we're okay with that. 
another interesting question just came and says, you talked about a mismatch of a pitch. Can you talk about investor targeting? How do you identify investors that are most aligned with your mission? Uh, there's a lot of questions on this. It seems like the audience it's, really it's in that. It's the homework. Yeah. It is there. Yeah. You go, you know, you you go and you dig. If if it's if it's a bank, you want to find out what their size is, what their size is relative to other banks. You want to find out their service area. You want to find out if they do ha if they have a foundation or they have a CDC. It's the homework so that you really understand how what you want to achieve aligns with what they exist for. But I would just really quick, because I know we got to wrap up, get the business in order first. <laughs> Right, I think sometimes, particularly in in our market uh, in the upper Midwest, it's like go on, get an investor, go on, and there is so much work that the founder hasn't done yet. So get your business in order, get your operations in order, um, because then you actually have the space <laughs> to be able to do this homework and then start it early, not when you need money. Start looking for money when you don't need money. Right? <laughs> Just want to say a thank you, 1130, for being here. I want everyone to go ahead and stand up one more time. Go ahead and stand up before we send you off to lunch. <laughs> and we just want to say, repeat after me, I am impactful. I am impactful. And I am powerful. I am powerful. Thank you, 1130.